Welcome everybody. I'm Nate Persley. Uh, I'm the director of the Cyber Policy Center here at Stanford. Uh, and this is an impromptu sort of hastily organized conversation on uh, the role of state media and social media in uh, the crisis in Ukraine. Um, I'm still, so lots of people are, are I feel like I'm watching the stock market ticker here as, as many people join here. Uh, uh, and so uh, we'll start in just a minute. Um, uh, but the goal of this uh, session is to really just find out what is happening, um, what's happening on the platforms, what those who are informed about the region are, um, are thinking about, uh, and, uh, and to really sort of try to keep pace with what are very fast moving uh, events. As many of you know, just before this call, um, Russia shut down Facebook in, uh, in Russia. Uh, so the, the all-star panel that we have today in the order that they'll speak, uh, Nathaniel Gleicher uh, from uh, Meta, head of, uh, uh, I'm forgetting his title now, head of security at Meta, I'm gonna call it. Yoel Roth, head of integrity uh, at, um, at Twitter. Uh, follow him will be uh, Maricha Shake, our international uh, policy fellow at uh, HII, international policy director at the Cyber Policy Center, former member of the uh, European Parliament. Uh, Rene DeResta, of our own uh, research director of the Stanford Internet Observatory, and Alex Demos uh, from the uh, Stanford Internet Observatory, and Alicia Wanless uh, uh, of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and Mike McFall, former ambassador to Russia and, and, and head of the Freeman Spokely Institute, will probably jump in, uh, and probably in between hits with uh, MSNBC or whoever else. So I thought what we'll do is we will just start with Nathaniel and Yoel telling us what's happening, what, what measures they've taken so that we everybody understands uh, how the platforms have been dealing with state media um, at, in this crisis, uh, because every day there seems to be a new intervention. And so if you could just sort of level set for people what exactly is going on, uh, I think that would be the sort of most productive use of our first 10 minutes or so. Uh, and then we can talk a little bit, um, uh, get the European perspective from, from Maricha and then have a larger discussion. So Nathaniel, let me turn it over to you and then to you all. Thanks, Nate. Thanks everybody for joining. As, uh, as Nate said, Nathaniel Gleiser, Head of Security Policy at Facebook. Um, I'll just give a bit of an overview on some of the things we're doing around state media and in the region generally, and then look forward to the conversation. Uh, I would say in terms of just anchoring the actions we've taken, so we've demonetized Russian state media around the world. We have also taken steps to downrank and demote Russian state media entities and remove them from recommendations. We have also downranked and demoted links to Russian state media websites. Similarly, the goal here is to uh, reduce the amplification and reduce the awareness of these platforms. We continue to identify and label new Russian state media entities. Uh, the teams actually identified several dozen in the last few weeks as they've continued the investigation. I expect we'll find more. We also have our teams of third party fact checkers that are fact checking content on Russian state media. I think as many people know, not that long ago, the Russian government asked us to remove a number of these fact checks from content posted by Russian state media. We declined to do so. As a result, they began throttling our services in Russia. And as Nate mentioned, as of earlier today, I understand they've made a decision to fully block Facebook within Russia as they're also doing to other social media. We'll focus on sort of actions around state media in particular in this conversation, but I do think it's worth it to situate this in the broader conversation about what's happening in Ukraine and Russia. So just to say a couple of things about some other steps that are happening there, We've taken steps to help people in Ukraine and Russia lock down their accounts or easily increase privacy settings on their accounts to protect people on the ground, both because of risk to individuals in Ukraine and as a result of increasing reporting of targeting of protesters against the war in Russia. We've also reported on some sophisticated targeting efforts, targeting public debate in Ukraine, in particular an influence operation uh, with links back to Russian linked actors, and then also ongoing targeting of prominent voices in Ukraine. And I wanted to call this out just here as we're starting in the conversation to say that, so on Sunday we mentioned there had been ongoing targeting of Ukraine military personnel and other prominent voices attempting to compromise their accounts on our platforms and elsewhere. Our teams are monitoring and responding to this, but there are also some steps that everyone can take 
And so I just wanted to call out that if certainly if you're in region and listening to this, but also if you have friends or colleagues who are in region that you're regularly in contact with, I think it's really important for everyone to turn on two-factor authentication, in particular app-based two-factor authentication for not just your social media accounts, but your personal email and related accounts. Don't reuse passwords that you use on different services. And in particular, if you're speaking with colleagues in region to use end-to-end -end encrypted platforms, obviously WhatsApp is end-to-end -end encrypted by default. Signal is also end-to-end -end encrypted and is another good platform to use. Um, for Facebook and Instagram, if you're in region, you can toggle direct communications on both of those platforms into end-to-end -end encrypted mode so that people can address risks in region. Um, that's sort of some of the facts that are on the ground. I'm sure that we'll talk a lot about the trade-offs here and the balances. The only other thing that I would say that we're watching also is the other thing that's happening is a lot of engagement across social media into Russia and between Russia and Ukraine as people are trying to get accurate information about what's happening in Ukraine. In fact, we've seen President Zelensky and others sort of directly appeal to people in Russia in Russian through, through social media platforms to sort of get accurate information out and try to drive towards a more peaceful resolution. And so as we all think about the steps that we need to take on state media and other steps, I also we're also trying to think about how we can make sure that those types of exchanges can continue to happen. And we have teams that are working on that as well. So I'll pause there and I'll just say thank you to everyone who's on the call and to everyone who's listening, who I know are working around the clock on helping refugees, on protecting people in region and doing everything that you can. Uh, look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Yoel. Why don't you... Uh... Tell us uh, wait, sort of Twitter's perspective here. Yeah, thank you, Nate. And thank you to everybody for organizing this so quickly. I know this is a situation where uh, there's a lot changing from day to day and, and seemingly minute to minute, uh, including sort of as yet unconfirmed rumors that, that Twitter has been blocked in Russia. We're seeing the same news that, that all of y'all are, although we can't yet confirm it. But I actually want to step backwards in time a little bit and start the story of Twitter's handling of state media in 2017, when we took our first actions on RT and Sputnik to block them from advertising on the Twitter platform. We took this action after we observed their role in interference in the 2016 elections in the United States. And it was at that moment that we took the global action of blocking them from running any advertisements and monetizing on our services. We donated the proceeds from their historical advertisements to supporting media literacy, and, and pro-democracy efforts worldwide. And that's been a policy that we've had in place since 2017. If you step forward to 2020, we rolled out labels on the accounts of state media outlets in Russia, China, and elsewhere to provide direct transparency about the specific accounts in question. To be clear, this isn't just about RT and Sputnik, although that's been where the EU directive and other regulations have focused. We've labeled more than 100 state media outlets in Russia alone, and that's the specific accounts of the outlets themselves. Of course, RT and Sputnik are some of the most prominent and well-known, but we've labeled state-controlled media that operate primarily domestically, as well as a number of emergent outlets that have been more active on social media in the West, including Ruptly and Redfish, some of these accounts that we see very frequently active in moments of crisis and strife. They've been labeled under our policies as well. And we've been rolling out state media labels to a number of countries. What do these labels do? The first thing they do is provide transparency. In a lot of instances, it's fairly clear that something is a state-backed media outlet. The, the R in RT is Russia, right? We, we generally know that. But especially for some of these novel outlets like Ruptly and Redfish, it can sometimes be a little bit more challenging to know who's behind it. And so by providing that direct context, we're helping people understand what it is that they're dealing with. But the second, and I would argue more important intervention here, is we substantially reduce the distribution of these outlets across Twitter. And that's been in place since 2020. Whenever we label an account as being a state-affiliated media outlet, we remove that account from our top search results. So if you click on a trend and you see the resulting tweets, they'll never show up there. And we'd never recommend these accounts or amplify them through any of our product features. And again, that's functionality that predates any of the present directives and the present crisis in Ukraine. This week, we took an additional step. We observed by looking at some of the data on Twitter 
that the vast majority of the reach that Russian state media were getting was organic rather than driven by their own and operated accounts. Certainly RT and Sputnik operated accounts on Twitter that had a sizable following. They would get a number of retweets. They'd been labeled since 2020. But if you look at the overall volume of the conversation about state media, most of it is driven organically by real people who are sharing that content of their own volition. And we wanted to make sure that the same context and labeling and also non-amplification interventions that we have for the owned and operated accounts are available for those tweets as well. Since the start of the, the conflict in Ukraine, we've seen the volume of tweets sharing Russian state media skyrocket from an average of about 20,000 tweets a day to peaking at more than 65,000 tweets per day, sharing links to RT, Sputnik, and other outlets. On that basis, we made the decision to roll out tweet-level labels for all Russian state media outlets. Those labels have the same interventions as the labels that we applied to the accounts of the media outlets themselves. We'll never amplify them. We'll never recommend them. They don't appear in our top search results. And we have reason to believe the data is still emerging but we see that these interventions on average reduce the distribution of this content by more than 80%. So there's an 80% reduction in the number of impressions that these tweets and accounts receive on the basis of the interventions that we make here. These are not Russia specific policies for us, as has been the case with our state media labeling, we're doing it globally, and we're expecting to continue to roll these labels out in the coming days and weeks to all of the other countries that we've designated and labeled state media for. Finally, I just want to note, echoing Nathaniel, state media is a key part of the interventions that we're making in this space, but they are by no means the only ones that we are making. We've offered localized security guidance to our users around the world in Ukrainian, in Russian, in English, um, and we're continuing to make available up to the minute guidance about how to secure your account, how to have conversations on Twitter in a safe way, um, and are working to ensure that we are elevating credible voices covering the conflict in Ukraine through our curation products and our explore tab, as well as prompts in our search experience. All of these holistically add up to the interventions we're aiming to make um, to promote a healthy information environment, even during a conflict where the messiness of the information environment is perhaps its defining characteristic. But uh, glad that we have the chance to, to connect about the work that we're doing here. Excited for this discussion. And again, thank you, Nate, for convening us so quickly. Well, thank you. I've got a few questions for you all, but I want to turn it over to Maricha um, uh, to sort of give us what's happening in Europe. I mean, among other things, <laughs> I, the EU has banned Russia, banned RT and, um, and Sputnik, right, from um, um, these services as well as TV. Uh, I also want to encourage folks uh, in the audience, if they want to throw in a um, question into the q and I'll try to integrate it into our discussion afterwards. So Maricha, let me turn it over to you and give us the view from Amsterdam. Thank you so much, Nate. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I want to offer a little bit of context with a few pointers to give you a sense of what I think the context in Europe is within which the whole question of the spreading of disinformation uh, takes place. Uh, obviously, I am devastated, and uh, I think most people here are extremely worried about how much worse Russian violence against Ukrainians will still get. Um, we've seen what I think are unprecedentedly uh, heavy sanctions imposed on Russia. Um, but it should not be underestimated that the pain of those um, sanctions will also be felt for uh, average Europeans. And it's very debatable whether they will actually change Putin's course. But of course, uh, it is now a matter of principle uh, to support these sanctions. And a lot of companies are also going above and beyond to show where they stand in this conflict to help refugees and so on and so forth. Um, the heavy sanctions, I think, are politically uh, justifiable. There is a risk of overreach. We've seen uh, Russian musicians and concerts canceled, uh, Russians evicted from their apartments, collaborations between museums in Russia and Europe ended. And so I think the backlash is something to, to um, uh, push back against. But clearly, Russia is now a pariah state, and I think it will become increasingly isolated. I do expect that there will be a growing pushback against the heavy sanctions uh, and also more questioning of what the proper European reactions to this war might be, given the risk that people see uh, of escalation. 
Uh, and certainly when the economic pain will be felt for ordinary Europeans, notably because of energy prices, uh, it will become more contested. The exposure of the fallout of this war is very tangible uh, here in Europe. Think about the unprecedented amount of refugees that are coming in. Uh, and I think that really the only silver lining this week has been the outpour of support for these refugees, unlike what we saw with people fleeing Syria when Russia was bombarding civilians there. I think the past week has made the impossible possible with regard to sanctions, um, but it also really made me wonder why the notion of reaching a moral limit about the role of Vladimir Putin as the aggressor that he is required this invasion of Ukraine. Um, I think a lot of introspection has been happening among political leaders in democracies, but I think it's also really important for social media companies. Neutrality doesn't work if it ever did. And I think all over the world, it is clear how much democracy, peace, the rule of law are under attack and how much of a role disinformation, propaganda and lies are playing in fanning anything from polarization to direct violence. The stance and the positions of European audiences are important for how uh, the international community can continue to respond to the fallout of the war and hopefully uh, pushing to end it. But um, the polarization of audiences and populations in Europe may well uh, become a bigger issue. And it will be a very important point for Putin to be able to find more allies in Europe. Um, it's a space to watch in France, where Marine Le Pen, uh, a longtime ally of Vladimir Putin, is polling high. Obviously, she's trying to walk back a little bit from the close ties that she has with President Putin. But when you look across Europe, uh, the, the relationships are warm between the far right uh, and himself. Another development of the last week is that prominent anti-vaxxers, anti-vax movement leaders have morphed into pro-Putin mouthpieces. Now, on the blocking of state media, it is one step in that very, very heavy uh, sanction package that basically cancels everything in relation to Russia. However, it is unusual to block media and it is also controversial. Uh, there are a lot of people who worry about backlashes and it is not undisputed. Uh, Russia Today, RT, had very small percentages of viewers on television, but online obviously was different. It uh, was boasting about billions of views on YouTube, uh, best viewed television channel on YouTube compared to Western outlets like BBC and CNN. Um, I personally campaigned for a yes vote in the referendum around the Ukraine-EU association agreement where I heard, heard literal talking points coming from Russian state propaganda when I was uh, campaigning. Uh, similarly, in 2014, when Russia illegally annexed Crimea, the same narrative that we hear today is that Nazis rule Ukraine uh, as if that is a justification for the unjust and unjustifiable invasion. So information plays an important role and will continue to play an important role um, in Russia. I also think there is a broader question that will flow from decisions made in the context of this war around state propaganda, which is uh, how social media companies will handle handing a megaphone to dictators. It seems surreal almost that the Olympics in China ended only recently and that there was so little discussion about human rights violations there. Um, there are many, many um, propaganda channels and dictators that still really enjoy the benefits of having access to social media platforms. So I do think there should be a broader discussion about where moral limits lie, and I'll leave it there. Thank you, Maricha. I'm, I'm sure we'll return to some of those themes. Uh, Renee, you've just, I think just this week it, it published a, a piece on RT. Obviously, it wasn't just about this conflict, with, or, 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 or were you uh, republishing it? Uh, and I just saw it on, on Twitter this week. I think it was it was a new. New, new research on, on, uh, on RT and state media, is that right? Yes, this was new. This was published with um, Dr. Sam Bradshaw and Carly Miller, who uh, previously were, uh, were team members here at SIO. Um, 
as academic publishing works, you know, we submitted it a year ago. <laughs> right, right. Now, now it becomes relevant again. Now so it's out. Well timed. Um, thank you, thank you. So um, influence operations and disinformation campaigns have been the subject of news cycles for several years now, particularly those involving social media and particularly those precipitated by Russia, given this very high profile um, multi-year, multi-actor operation in 2016. But those efforts are part of a broader strategy. And at SIO, we try to assess these campaigns in the context of what we call a full spectrum propaganda model, arguing that states can run both broadcast and social media operations on a spectrum of attributability from overt to covert. So the kinds of um, you know social media uh, bot and troll campaigns fall on the spectrum of kind of uh, covert social. And then state media would, in the case of, of our social Social media conversation today fall in the realm of overt social, particularly as uh, as these these pages are labeled and and attribution is clear. Um, so while the covert activity on social media gets the bulk of media coverage, you know there's something kind of captivating about digital agents of influence and AI fake faces. The reach of those efforts are actually now usually quite limited, and particularly since 2018, uh, they come down a lot faster. The inauthentic um, activity policies, you know, teams like Nathaniel's and Yoel's impact the state actor strategy by making it harder and more costly to run those campaigns. And even in the case of Ukraine, within 48 hours of the shooting war starting, uh, Facebook and Twitter had taken down information war activity uh, in the form of small networks linked to Russia targeting Ukrainians. But the state media properties, of, as some have uh, alluded to, are different. And that's because they are permitted on platforms. And there's a variety of reasons for this and trade-offs to this, which we've kind of uh, begun to go into here. And I think other speakers will continue to. Um, but over the years, these these overt social, I'm sorry, these overt state properties um, have managed to attract audiences in the millions, tens of millions, in the case of China, hundreds of millions. And as you know, um, my, our colleagues from the social platforms have noted, that was without so much as a label for a fairly long period of time. So as the uh, these you know these platforms sorry these these pages have presences on social platforms what we began to look at was in the context of 2020 how they covered the black lives matter protests now this was a case study uh, that used blm because this was a very high profile summer of protests roughly for example one of the uh, one of the state affiliated uh, broadcasting entities was constantly live streaming the protests and what we observed was that that footage was taken by other state-linked entities associated with Russia and was spun into very, very different frames. So there were some outlets that used a strongly pro-Blue Lives Matter frame, and there were some outlets that used a strongly pro-Black Lives Matter frame. And this is interesting, and we wanted to try to unpack the dynamics around these newer entities. Uh, as you all noted, uh, Redfish, not immediately obvious to a viewer as state media, uh, some of the MAFIC media properties, including the ones that actually uh, sued Facebook when they were labeled as state media, they lost that lawsuit, uh, but they were putting out content, very video first content intended for millennial audiences that was strongly pro Black Lives Matter, while RT and Sputnik were putting out strongly pro Blue Lives Matter. And so we assessed uh, about several thousand, uh, three or 4,000 posts um, through this corpus of content that we obtained on CrowdTangle um, to try to look at the ways in which this playing both sides dynamic in some ways kind of hearkened to what we used to see done by the covert social operations, by the internet research agency running some pages that were uh, strongly pro Black Lives Matter that in fact were pretending to be Black Lives Matter activists, while others were pro Texas secession, uh, pro Confederate content, and looking at the ways in which uh, Russia had adapted its messaging to the modern information ecosystem. So I want to kind of now transfer the focus back to Ukraine. Um, the thing that is relevant about the work that we put out in this context is primarily that state media is an important tool in public diplomacy, in propaganda, and influence operations. And so the substance is, in some ways, kind of it's topic agnostic. The point should be on understanding the reach and the impact that these outlets can have and coming up with policies that recognize the unique role that they play in the ecosystem. I think my uh, co-author, Dr. Bradshaw, put it as, in today's digital ecosystem, propaganda posters have become memes and broadcasts have become live streams. And as the state avails itself of these tools, uh, the dynamic of state media on social media is worth additional study and carefully crafted policy. 
Wonderful. Thank you uh, so much. Um, so let me let me turn it over to Alex Stamos, uh, head of the uh, Stanford Internet Observatory, and then to Alicia Wanless, and then I want to have a larger conversation, um, uh, also integrating some of these questions. Alex, what, what's your reaction to what you've heard from the platforms and also where we are? You've been you've been tweeting a bit about what what you think might be the right. Well, this is not a unique uh, 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 time for, for tweeting on the, what the platform should do, but you, you've been tweeting about what you think they should do with respect to state media. So have at it. Yeah. So I, I want to keep it short because I do want to get to the conversation. I think will be interesting. But um, so a couple of things. Uh, one, yes, I mean, I, I believe, uh, you know, state media has always been kind of a unique challenge uh, for how the company should handle it because there's this asymmetry of especially state media from authoritarian states, that they are using censorship and other means to control their population. And then we uh, Americans are providing them with all of this amplification on our platforms because that's consistent with our view of freedom of expression. Um, and so like how to square that circle of, of how do we stop authoritarian state media without using exactly the same techniques as these authoritarians themselves, uh, I think is like a legitimately big challenge. Um, I think where the companies have ended up is a pretty good place. It took a while. I, I think uh, uh, what we've seen is that teams like uh, UL's and Nathaniel's have been on this problem for a while, but it, it, state media hasn't actually been the top of a lot of people's concerns. There's been a lot more discussion of the covert types of influence that Renee mentioned of people who are, you know, the fake accounts and, uh, and such, and, you know, kind of things that, that re are related to what happened in the 2016 U.S. election. And so kind of overt state media has not been an area of a lot of discussion. Um, uh, you know, I completely agree with Maricha, although I'm, I am going to point out that our European friends um, have been much more friendly with Russia uh, than Americans for the most part. And so I, I do appreciate that there is a shift here in how governments are acting as well when you have, you know, Germany you, you, until the last second, you know, trying to stand up for Nord Stream 2 and, and such. Um, so the fact that there's now kind of a massive reshuffling of how people treat Russia of, of not trying to pretend that uh, things are normal and okay, and that we are going to treat Russia as an authoritarian state, I think is good um, on, on a lot of levels. Um, so anyway, where I think the companies ended up is a pretty reasonable place, which is the isolation and quarantine of state media so that state media outlets still exist, but everything that is posted by them and then all their links are labeled and it is significantly harder to share them. Um, I would like to see quantitative data on that. Uh, I, I have offered to Nathaniel and uh, Yoel that we would love to see a paper in the Journal of Online Trust and Safety uh, on the uh, quantitative analysis uh, of what happened. But like, realistically, I'd like to see exactly what the impact has been um, before I, I really have judgment. But I do think that's a reasonable balance there to say they can exist, but then we're not going to give them the benefits of amplification. I think the for me, the big question now is, um, you know, this was a totally exigent circumstance. The companies had to move quickly to deal with a real emergency in which all these lives were at risk. How does this policy get uh, uh, used in the future? And especially the country that is most interested in here is China, right? Because until this week, Russia has actually had a much more open internet than China, right? For the most part, Russian uh, citizens had access to most or all of American social media. Um, and so in China, this disparity is much more uh, obvious in that you have the spokesperson of the Ministry of Foreign uh, Affairs able to troll and lie about COVID and such and has this huge Twitter account where he, he engages American politicians and such, but then his own citizens can't get to Twitter to see the opposing views, right? And so I think... That unbalance of if you're a state that that uses censorship to to cut off your own citizens, that they need to be treated differently. Um, and so I, I I think like as things calm down, we're going to do that. And I think that is in the bigger context that like corporations all over the world, not just tech companies, but all kinds of corporations are going to have to reassess their activities in totalitarian states. And I think democracies are going to have to get to the point where we we don't we no longer think oh well as long as we're making money. And our, our companies, our multinationals and our citizens are making money operating these authoritarian states that we're going to turn our back because this is what happens, right? Um, and so I think, yeah, obviously we have to focus on Ukraine and the humanitarian crisis there. Um, but, you know, when things settle down a little bit, unfortunately, we might have a multi-year, you know, uh, uh, insurgency there. Um, 
uh, uh, or battle between the Ukrainians and the Russians. So, so who knows how long this takes? But eventually, we're going to have to think about how this changes our behavior outside of Russia. Um, and I think China is the, the clear country and is also a much harder country to deal with just because they're so much more economically powerful than Russians. Great. Uh, let me turn it over to Alicia to round us out, and then, then I'll, I'll start posing some questions, uh, first to Nathaniel and Yoel, but then to the group as a whole. Yeah. Um, I, like Alex, I, I'm concerned about what the interventions made in the information environment as a result of this conflict are going to mean longer term. Um, so the idea of blocking state media and ultimately in retaliation, the Russians blocking access to Western websites and digital platforms is, is going to essentially piecemeal and fragment the international information environment. I think what we're seeing here is finally what Russia and China have been advocating for at a UN level for a long time, and that's digital sovereignty, having total control over their own information space. Uh, in the short term, the blocking of state media has encouraged a Russian response of blocking Western headquartered quarter digital platforms, removing a key channel through which prominent Russians have been expressing their dissatisfaction for the war. Um, so that takes away a key form of protest for them. But these blocks also restrict the availability of direct to public appeals like those of Zelensky's to the Russian people to try to erode their support for this invasion. Um, and indeed, we've already been seeing this happen with Russia taking down, uh, I think they've been blocking Radio Free Europe reported today that um, BBC is down, Deutsche Welle is down, Facebook, Twitter, Apple and Google's app stores were all blocked as of today. Um, in the longer term, if the authoritarian states block these platforms from operating in their countries, not only will it potentially diminish revenues for Western companies considerably, but it's also going to give China and Russia based firms, Chinese and Russian based firms, a significant advantage in increased market share. And that will be what their citizens turn to that we no longer have access to communicate with them either. So this will essentially create a splintered information ecosystem whereby the West has no ability to influence other countries uh, at all. And indeed of the five countries that supported Russia's war at the UN this past week, Eritrea was also one of the authoritarian co-sponsors along with Russia for a new resolution on disinformation that was passed at the UN General Assembly third committee in November, um, which I think can be a signal of what is more to come in terms of pushing digital sovereignty at an international level that many not so democratic states and maybe some of the countries in between will see as a model for them to control their own information space. So I really do think that even while this emerging crisis is very pressing and we have to respond, I think democracies have to keep an eye on geopolitics in the longer term game here and, and make a response at the UN level for what governing the information environment should actually mean with democratic principles. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so now let's let's uh, get into a conversation, uh, particularly about what's happening in the in, in this crisis to start. I, I wanted to get I want to pick a little bit at what Alex was saying and, and directed to, to Nathaniel and Yoel about how success, How do you know if these interventions are succeeding or not, right? I know you're not gonna turn over data here, but I mean, literally just something like um, labeling of state media, does, if you look before and after the, the imposition of labeling, is that in and of itself a tool that, that uh, decreases engagement? Obviously you mentioned demotion, of course, is, is, is going to have that effect because then people aren't going to, going to see it. But I was just wondering on, on the labeling side, because there's sort of social scientists who kind of go different directions on this, but I was wondering whether you're seeing a lot less engagement once you label these things as state media. I can kick this off and then Nathaniel, go ahead. Um, one of the things that happens whenever Twitter labels a tweet, whether it's state media or misinformation or COVID-19 or anything like that, is when you go to share the tweet or engage with it in some fashion, we pop up what we call a nudge. It's a gentle message that just says, hey, this thing might be misinformation or it might be state controlled media. Think about it before you share this content. And we don't block the actions. We give people the choice to behave organically, but we see that these nudges are incredibly effective. Filing this one away under additional data Alex would like us to publish in the Journal of Online Trust and Safety, TM. Um, we, we see that in general, uh, there is a 40% nice decrease plug. in the, I know, right? Uh, there's a 40% decrease in the engagement rate whenever we show these nudges on tweets. So that means without having to block somebody, without taking away their agency, we actually see that people voluntarily choose not to engage with labeled content just because we pop up a small interstitial warning that adds one additional click of friction. Renee has written and spoken a ton about the value and importance of this type of friction in social media products. We have the data that substantiates that it works. 
And that's why we keep leaning into label-based solutions because it takes you out of the conversation about censorship. It takes you out of this question of, are social media companies taking away entirely the distribution of content or not? We're saying, we're going to give people the context to make these decisions themselves. And we see that there's a 40% reduction in the frequency with which people share it. The other question is long-term effects, right? Like you, you then are asking, is there better awareness of what these informational dynamics look like? Do more people know that the, that the Russian government is exercising editorial control over these outlets and that that's even a thing that's happening? That's a much longer run social science question that I think we need to study and understand. But the hope, I think, cumulatively is that between social media labels, between the EU directive, between extensive press coverage of these dynamics, one of the things we'll start to see over time is greater awareness of the fact that state media is a thing that exists, that it's an instrument of statecraft, and that we see it deployed in times of conflict to try to advance the views of specific sides. Right, Nathaniel, you want to add a little bit about how you can see whether your, your interventions are effective? So there are a couple things that I would add just to build on what Noel said. The first is it's interesting because it's, it's worth being precise. We're talking about different types of labels here, and there are a number of different steps in place, right? So there are state media labels, which exist on tweets on Twitter, exist on pages and posts in Facebook that simply indicate that the entity that is behind a post is uh, is a state controlled media entity, right? And that provides context to users about what they're hearing, right? Then there are, as you all described them, nudges. We call them reshare friction, which is if you choose to take an action to share something like this for Russian state media on Facebook, you get a sort of, are you sure you wanna do this note? And there the impact, so you said that you're measuring impact is a combination of both the label and the actual friction. The simple fact, it turns out that anytime you ask someone to click online, you impose friction on them continuing on their path and you slow down what they're doing. So you have both of those factors. Then in addition to that, there are, so on, on and then in addition to that on Facebook, we have labels from third-party fact checkers. So if a state media entity like any other entity posts something that is false or misleading and a third-party fact checker reviews it and determines that it is false or misleading, then there are labels on the piece of content as well. So you have these many different sort of tiers of labels. And what's important about this and interesting here is it's worth remembering when we talk about state media entities that social media platforms are only one piece of the media environment that they operate in and that they, all, that they have many other mechanisms by which they can amplify their messages and by which people can find their content. And so the strategy here that we use that I think is similar to what Twitter uses is we don't want people to stumble across Russian state media entity, Russian state media information unintended, right? We don't want it to be amplified in their feed. As sort of Alex described, we're sort of quarantining it, we're reducing it. But the truth is, if someone wants to go out and find content like this, they'll be able to find it on other platforms, other places on the internet, broadcast, et cetera. If they find it on one of our platforms, it will have context around it. It will have a label saying it's Russian state media. And it will also have, if the claim is false or misleading, a label articulating that and linking to a detailed analysis from a third party fact checker on why that claim is false and giving them that context. And so this combination means that you have the demotions and the labels up front that provide the context. And then it also means that if someone seeks it out, when they find it, it still has that context around it, as opposed to them going off to another medium and finding it without that context. And so that's part of the trade-off here that I think is important to think about, especially as we talk about blocking versus sort of the quarantining action that we've taken. It's worth noting, even in the EU, where um, there has been direct directives to block this, and in Ukraine, where we, and I think Twitter, have blocked Russian state media completely in response to specific government requests, that's only sort of certain state media entities, and then it becomes sort of a patchwork conversation about how you're covering it. Well, I see Mike McFaul has joined us uh, uh, between hits, I am assuming. I mean, he's probably the busiest man outside the region, I would think, uh, 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 when it comes to this conflict. And so, Mike, we've been talking a little bit about all of the different uh, interventions that the platforms have taken, as well as some that the European governments have taken with respect to um, RT and Sputnik, but also disinformation generally. Um, since you know, Lord knows you, you've, you've researched these uh, issues and certainly all the politics of the region more than almost anyone. Uh, what are your sort of two cents um, 
that you can give us on, on your perspective of what's happening. I should say right, be right before the, the, this webinar, um, uh, Russia bat banned Facebook uh, from, from Russia. Uh, and, and so we spoke about that as well. Well, thanks, Nate. I apologize for being late. It was, um, I do have a TV hit in 12 minutes. So I'll drop <laughs> when they call, when you hear the Skype uh, ch chime in. But uh, to be honest, I'm late because I had a choice of joining you on time or going to a rally with five or 600 uh, people here on campus with my Ukrainian students. And they pleaded with me to come. And so that's why I, I made that choice. I, and I know I made the, reason. I know I made the right choice with no disrespect to everybody here. Uh, it was a very, very emotional uh, uh, event. <clears throat> we have a lot, quite a few Ukrainian uh, students here on campus, as well as Russians, some who very just spoke very bravely. Um, I miss, I don't want to talk about, there's lots of expertise here. So I'm going to talk just for two minutes to flip it around, especially upon the news. Uh, so it is now confirmed. I saw it last night that uh, Facebook was going to be banned. Was Twitter banned as well? We don't know. Yeah, we don't know. We are. Uh... There are rumors that we are blocked, but we haven't yet been able to confirm it. Confirm it, right. There are a couple of sensors that are showing that. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of people buying Russian uh, VPSs uh, with Bitcoin yeah. right now. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, I, perhaps I, I, without IRB approval. I'm just going to throw that out there because my bosses are on <laughs> yeah, here. Of course. So, well, okay. I, I, you know, I tweeted last night late uh, that, to ask people and people wrote to me and said uh, those things. But, um, but, but I want to flip it around. And maybe it's just a, a question to chew on for another day. Uh, but this is happening to, to your platforms. Uh, in the last uh, several days, um, uh, media that I know well, Doge TV and Echo Moskvi, uh, Doge TV is a, a television station that was pushed off the air, uh, has been web-based, uh, but they just got closed down. Echo Moskvi uh, is the iconic uh, radio station, but it's a media company, They've been around for 20 years. And everybody thought they were always safe because their owner was Gazprom, by the way. And, and they're, they're the, the, the director, uh, Alexei Venediktov, he always played this very complicated game uh, between the regime and opposition. Uh, they just got closed down. And I talked to one of their senior people last night. And we could go through all the other ones that have been closed down. I just ran into Roman Badanin, if anybody knows him. Uh, they've been closed down. Uh, so the question is not what we do to stop disinformation. I think the question has to be, what do we do to promote information inside Russia? Um, and, and I don't have the answer, uh, but I, I know lots of people that are concerned. And, and how could we more creatively uh, think about that, 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 that to flip that around? Um, obviously, Putin shutting these people down because he's afraid, right? He wouldn't be shutting them down if, if everything was going uh, peachy king, if they're not. Um, this is a, it's an indicator of his state of mind um, and I think that, you know, it, it, rather than just being a passive, you know, I, I'm not an expert like everybody here, but I've been to uh, years and years of these meetings about, you know, are we a platform? Are we a media company? Blah, blah, blah those, all those things. I want to challenge uh, those from the, the, the private sector um, to think more proactively about what you can do to support information. Uh, Let's be clear, folks, this is, a, this is a fork in the road in the history of the planet. This is a moment of good and evil. This is a moment of, uh, that has giant implications, not just for Ukraine, but most certainly for Russia, most certainly for Europe. Um, and so you gotta get off the fence. There's, there's just no more of this bullshit of, you know, that's not what we do and this is, is I, I really sincerely believe this. Uh, my friends are being bombed right now uh, in Ukraine. My friends, well, some of my friends are already in jail in Russia, um, but, uh, but they have relied on you all uh, for a long time. And now when that closes, we've got to figure out, you know, just something much more proactive. Uh, it's, just, it's just not good enough to say it's not our problem. And, you know, we're neutral or, you know, we're doing our, we're putting, you know, and I, I want to be clear, I support all these things. I think, you know, I think what has happened in the last 10 days, what's happened over the last years, I'm a huge fan. And every time, yeah, I'm looking at Nathaniel and y'all right now, you know, every time you guys do something, I praise you. And, uh, you know, I got 700,000 Twitter followers, y'all. So, uh, you know, I'm praising you to a lot of people, <clears throat> including a lot of members of Congress. Uh, we were just talking about your companies uh, with uh, a very prominent member of Congress. Uh, I better not name her because uh, that might not be appropriate on this live uh, call. But but I just, you know, my plea is 
uh, it's stop the disinformation fight is important, but now we need a more proactive information fight. Um, and and I'm, I'm telling you from the bottom of my heart, the, the Ukrainians want it and the, the Russians want it. And, and we got to figure out how to change that, that conversation. One thing that was mentioned uh, uh, before you joined it, but it's not directly responsive to this, but I want to shift in this direction, is um, how Facebook has now allowed for uh, encrypted, greater use of encrypted messaging inside, um, was it both Russia and Ukraine, I think, I can't remember. Um, and, and we did get some questions in the chat about, about what we think is going to happen with Telegram and Signal uh, in these countries. Um, Nathaniel, do you want to, given uh, what Mike said, do you want to maybe and then you will give you a chance as well. Yeah, I mean, I would just say, Mike, I com actually completely agree with you on the importance of getting out as much accurate information as possible in two dimensions. First is, how can we maintain access to the extent that it's possible for people to use the platforms they're using? Some of the most impassioned and powerful information sharing we've seen in the conflict so far has been across social media platforms. People from Ukraine appealing to people in Russia, people in Russia speaking out against the war and the reverse. And obviously we're going to see increased efforts to contain this from Russia, more and more efforts to shut this down. The more that all of us can do to enable that access, I think is very important. And I know that there's work being done for more encrypted communications, more access to the platforms. Alex mentioned VPSs, right? That's one piece of it. And then the second piece of it is what can we do to amplify authentic information or accurate information, both on the platforms outside of Russia. So I think there's a lot of question about making sure people understand what's happening in this region. And I think that's critical, but also into other platforms, into the public debate in Russia. And of course, that third piece is the hardest piece. And in some ways, it's the most critical. Uh, and I think it's something that all of us, I think all the, certainly all the companies I'm sure are thinking this, I know we are, how can we support efforts that are off of our platforms, you know, to t try to take appropriate and important steps in this space. I think that there's been, and we've seen a big pull together from industry, from civil society and others to get accurate information out around other crises. This is a uh, unprecedented crisis. It's a unique and terrible situation. And my hope is we can learn from some of that and think about other steps we can take as well. Yoel, is there anything you'd like to say in response to what Mike said? Sure. The one thing, I mean, Mike, I, I agree foundationally, elevating credible information and authoritative content to fill in the gaps that are left behind when platforms do what we have to do to remove the bad stuff is an absolutely essential part of this. I want to highlight one thing that has felt markedly different about this conflict, which is the role of the OSINT community and of people studying the evidence coming out of the conflict in real time and in public. The amount of media verification that we are seeing take place live on Twitter has been an incredible asset, not just for the folks on the ground, but I think for everybody who's watching the conflict around the world. Encouraging those types of efforts and surfacing them to people so that they can use that information is a key part of what we're doing. For instance, if we see a piece of manipulated media, let's say it's a video from a video game that's being shared as if it's footage from battles on the ground, which has happened once or twice a minute in the last two weeks. Right. Yeah, <laughs> hypothetically. Uh, in those situations, we see people debunking that content and pointing to the original sources that's happening on Twitter. And so when you see a manipulated media tag on a tweet, if you click on that tag, that actually takes you to a curated collection of expert content that says, here's where this came from, here's the situation, no, this is not actually a paratrooper landing in Kiev. And I think that that's an incredibly important addition to just enforcing TOS, just combating disinformation, because you're giving people direct access to the authoritative voices that can help them understand if that's not what's happening, what actually is taking place on the ground. Great, thank you. Can we talk a little bit about the other platforms and some that are owned by these companies, but, but um, maybe, I don't know whether Alicia, Alex or Renee, on the, it's, we've got some questions in the chat about Telegram and Signal and what we think that, so, so um, how easy would it be? I mean, are they gonna be the next shoes to drop in these countries? Uh, and how easy would it be to, to do so? Obviously they provide a particular service that we were talking about before. Um, I don't know if you wanna jump in on those. So I'm gonna talk about Telegram real fast. Um, so for all of our talk about the American companies, it's a little bit chauvinist. The truth is, is the most important platform in in theater right now is Telegram by far in both Russian Russia and Ukraine and probably 
the most important from kind of a disinformation and as well as a true information perspective um, in both Russia and Ukraine. There's some real problems with Telegram. Telegram is not really end-to-end encrypted. They have created a belief among activists and other folks that they are as protected as they would be on Signal or WhatsApp, and they are not. Um, only private messages between two people where you opt in or they end up encrypted. The people are mostly part of these big channels where they're having these discussions. In fact, the Russian military was dropping flyers in, in cities and in there it said, join our official telegram channel. So the Russian military is running official telegram channels and in there, one, nothing is encrypted. And then we really don't know what is being done with both the, the content that is flowing through Telegram, and then most importantly, the metadata, such as what are the phone numbers of these individuals and their GPS coordinates, which could, of course, in war, be used to kill people. Um, Telegram is this weird entity. It's privately held. It has a bunch of Russian money in it. A bunch of people who run it are Russian. Now, some of them have weird relationships and negative relations with the Russian government, although most of that doesn't seem to be based upon politics, but upon like fights of who owns how much certain things so like telegram is an extremely sketchy thing for people to be using in ukraine to be frank and um it is a really uh, th- this is a, a a big challenge i think um what, what they do around state media to me is not as relevant as the data security and data access issues because so many people are using telegram for their day-to-day communications and probably for even moving military units and and doing things like giving updates uh, inside the country. Um, and what is happening to that content, that metadata is a question that nobody nobody really has a good answer for. Um, now, how, how do you get people on Signal and WhatsApp? So this is one of the reasons why Russia probably blocked the, the app stores is I expect that they went to Google and Apple and they said, block these encrypted messengers. Google and Apple said no. So Google and Apple are now shut down. Apple said yes to that in China just to be frank, right? Um, so you cannot download WhatsApp, you can't get Signal, you can't get VPNs in China on your iPhone. Um, but Apple probably stood up to Russia in this case, and now it's it, the App Store is blocked. Um, if you have an Android phone and you're in Russia, you can sideload those apps, but you're going to have to go get them. And what I expect we're going to see is um, on the major you know, Russian uh, search engines like Yandex, you're going to end up with uh, backdoored versions and watering hole attacks for people who are trying to get secure messengers and then side sideload those onto their Android phones. And so um, the fact that th- they don't have access to like the trusted stores is, a, is a actually a really big problem. Now, th- Russia probably can't keep that forever because effectively your iPhone is effectively useless if it can't get to Apple services for a long period of time. Um, and so I- I'm not sure what the, the long-term game plan is there. Alicia, did you want to jump in here? Yeah, absolutely. Two points. Um, What Alex is raising is really important uh, around cybersecurity and the devices. So what's likely going to happen as you see potentially cities fall, Ukrainians being captured, is that their phones will be taken by Russians and looked at to get more intelligence out of them. This is something that we saw in the Syrian conflict, and it's really crucial right now to start to get digital safety practices into Ukrainian to those audiences. Um, And back to your original question, Nate, about Uh, other platforms that are operating there. We've got a lot of smaller platforms like Viber, which have been widely used by Ukrainians in the eastern part of the country to communicate. Um, I'm not sure what the status of of those platforms are in terms of what the measures they're they're taking are, but they're much smaller and will not have the resources of some of the bigger ones. So I think really key here is, is getting some standard operating practices out to Ukrainians to get their phones, their devices and accounts secured immediately is is very crucial. Maricha. Well, I just wanted to come back to the the notion that, you know, um, Nathaniel and and Joel mentioned that they were going to push out more authoritative information. And I really think, you know, the stakes are so high in this conflict. Who are going to be the experts involved? How is that going to go? You know, I think we really need much more transparency, a broader set of people looking at this and also uh, a matching between the um, information environment that Alicia also mentioned, which of course, is increasingly being fragmented due to different policies all over the world. But there was never one information ecosystem when you looked at the laws that already applied in country. And this is particularly true for Russia. So the consequences of speech were always very different, even if, you know, the use of platforms may have technically been possible in different places. And I think that that should not be forgotten how Uh, particularly now with the severe crackdowns on speech in Russia on top of how bad it already was, um, the consequence for people using platforms, even if they are available, can be significant. And that needs to be taken into consideration. And I honestly think it would be really hard for 
uh, private companies to make all these very, very high stake decisions uh, in isolation and uh, in, in, in the rooms of people that they always work with. Nathaniel, did you say you wanted to respond to something that Alicia mentioned? Well, I think it connects to some of what Marietta was saying and what Alicia was saying, which is just this point about safety in region is so incredibly critical right now. I think one thing that's really has been very good to see in recent weeks, to your point, Marietta, is I don't see anyone making decisions sort of in isolation. I see a lot of conversation and collaboration and sharing of information between government partners civil society who can sort of say what's happening on the ground and platforms that are trying to assess how to take the right and the most protective action. For um, people who are in country, I would just say, uh, I mentioned earlier, we have a program called Lock Profile that we have that is available for people in both Ukraine and Russia. It is by no means a silver bullet and there's nothing that is a silver bullet against these types of threats. But I do think it's important for people to take the steps they can take to protect themselves which includes both enabling additional controls around your social media accounts, ensuring that your accounts have two-factor and other protections in place, and thinking very deliberately about the actions that you take and the implications that that can have, right? I think that this is a, it's a fast-moving situation, and there are very serious threats on the ground. All of us are doing everything we can to help with that, but the most important message to get out is the tools that are available for people to protect themselves or to, for example, find resources or help if they need to get across Ukraine to a more safe location or they're trying to figure out the situation where they are in Russia. Uh, feel free not to answer this question, but I'm just, get, just to get a sense of the, the number. Love of it people. when you start questions like that. No, right? this, is not, this is not like a, a... Do you feel like you're back in law school when yeah, uh, right. Nate starts to... <laughs> I'm not grading him uh, yet. Uh, but 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 I, I, I agree to me in law school either. This is really just an informational question about the scale of your company's operations in Russia. If you feel comfortable, I don't know. There may be security reasons you don't want to say something like that. But I, but I'm sure someone knows this. I mean, does Facebook? I mean, are there a lot of Facebook employees in Russia, or is is it relatively not? And, and for that matter, Ukraine. Uh, I don't want to talk about employees in region for sort of obvious safety reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. That's that. I understand well, the that's question. Why I, was but, you wouldn't, I, I was just wondering if, in the abstract whether they, if, you know, if, if you were going to, if there were people, because that's that's obviously the, one of the real concerns here. I mean, you see this in other conflict zones um, that that now that they blocked Facebook, they could go after the people there. And so, I, I mean, I think it's. I'm sorry, go ahead, Nate. No, I was just to say, I, I think it's worth saying, right? For us, we don't have operations in Russia, and I can say that. Um, I think it's worth saying that for any company, obviously, one of the really important priorities is how do we keep our people safe and what can we do to make sure they're safe also. So that's a calculation that every company is going to have to be engaged in. You will also find that companies aren't going to talk about that in too much detail because it could draw attention to the exact thing that they're trying to protect. Right. As you say, in, in Advocate, like we, everybody focuses on companies actually having offices, and that is a big deal for the companies that are blended, right? So the Microsofts, the Googles, the companies that have like large enterprise and cloud product sides have large offices. Uh, and I just wrote a blog post about how to shut those down. Like that's a big problem. That's that's not really a tech, just a tech issue. Is uh, Russia was deeply integrated in the world economy, right? Like every major Fortune 500 a huge chunk of them had a Moscow office because it was just the normal thing to do, just like having a Paris office and a Berlin office. Um, and so now you have the whole Fortune 500 having to figure out how do we take care of our employees? How do we even pay them? So a company I was, I was talking to, you can't get money in anymore. So the amount of money that you have, which has now been massively devalued if it's, if it's uh, uh, in rubles, and if you're holding euros or dollars in a Russian bank, they won't let you touch those and you can't convert them at a normal rate. Um, how do you even pay your people in Russia? How do you pay them severance if you're going to shut down? That's a huge problem. Um, but uh, so th that's all an issue. The, the other thing you have to realize is even if a tech company like Twitter and Facebook don't have operations in Russia, every company in Silicon Valley has a large number of people who are citizens of Russia and the People's Republic of China and who still have families there. And I think that's something that we that like has to be of a concern for everybody who, who does this kind of work. Um, is them taking hostage family members. Uh, and that, that has certainly happened in the Chinese case. I can't think of a Russian case, although it's, it's possible. Um, and, uh, I, and I think that's something that governments really need to get on top of. Like companies can't handle that themselves, right? So like making sure that the, the you know, it, it's a weird one because you're talking about people who are nationals who are not your citizens, but they, if we, 
if we want these companies to continue to act in a way that is aligned with democracies, then democracies are going to have to do what they can to protect families so that you don't have CEOs making this horrible choice between somebody's mom uh, in St. Petersburg um, and the company doing the right thing. On that happy note, I think we'll end, but th thank you all very much. This was fantastic. Exactly what we uh, hope for and like exactly what we try to produce here at the Cyber Policy Center. For those who haven't come to our webinars before, we'll have another one next Tuesday uh, at, at noon with Rick Hassan of the UC Irvine uh, Election Law Scholar. He has got a new book called Cheap Speech, which is all about the effect of social media and the internet on, on elections uh, and particularly on things like political advertising, campaign finance and election speech. Uh, so thank you again to everybody who participated in this and thank you to the audience for joining. See you next time.